1 Samuel 14. We're going to look at a passage in 1 Samuel 14, verses 1 through 15, as a great illustration, a great example uh, to our lives uh, and how to live our lives in obedience and in, in trusting the Lord. The title of the message this evening is The Picture of Trusting and Obeying. The Picture of Trusting and Obeying. 1 Samuel chapter 14. In 1917, I, by the way, I, I love history. I like history. Um, the, 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 the hard part of that is that I don't particularly care to read it, but I enjoy watching it. So I watch a lot of documentaries. I'm, I, I enjoy uh, hearing all about history, and so I have a tendency to lean heavily towards uh, illustrations that uh, have to do with history. In 1917, General Allenby, along with the 6th British Division, entered the plains surrounding Megiddo and Michmash. Now those are two areas that are just uh, north of Jerusalem. And they were en route to attack Jericho and drive the Turkish army back out uh, across the Jordan River. Directly in their path was a small town of Michmash that was located on a high rocky hill overlooking the plain of Megiddo, also occupied by the Turks. It was almost impregnable with its sheer cliffs, and if I was as cool as Pastor Crockett, I would have really neat pictures up here with the cliffs and with the geography, and I just don't have that. So you have to use your imagination this evening. The British forces faced a problem. How would they penetrate that town uh, that they are trying to drive out the Turkish army from? How would they penetrate that town? General Allenby actually was a believer and he knew his Bible well. And he remembered that the name of the town, Michmash, is, is, uh, is in 1 Samuel chapters 13 and 14. And in chapter 14, it describes how Jonathan, along with his armor bearer, found a secret rocky passage on the hillside that led to the top of the town that was being used as a fortress for the Philistine army. With God's help in, in chapter 14 of 1 Samuel, Jonathan and his armor bearer, you probably know this story very well, were able to surprise the Philistines and in the confusion, the Philistines actually fought each other and were quickly and easily defeated. Now General Allenby and those with him discovered that the topography of the area where they were was still very similar. And they managed to find that passage that was talked about in Scripture, and his troops scaled the same sheer cliffs that Jonathan climbed thousands of years earlier. And they took the Turkish garrison by complete surprise. It was a decisive victory for General Allenby and the Commonwealth forces. Being victorious at Megiddo and Jericho and Jerusalem, he finally broke the power of the Turkish army, a very important development for the future of the Holy Land, the Middle East, and the outcome of the war. The narrative mentioned, however, in 1 Samuel chapter 14 has bearing on us today. Not that we're going out to attack a small little city at the top of a hill that's hard to get to. Not that. But the characteristics that Jonathan showed in his trust and in his obedience to God are found today in those who wholly trust and obey in the Lord. In this passage, we see that Jonathan displayed an unyielding trust and a determined obedience to God. We're going to see that. And we're also going to discover that trust and obedience manifests itself in certain biblical characteristics. If you are trusting and obeying God, you will see these characteristics in your life as well. We're going to see four of them today. Four characteristics that we see in this passage of trusting and obeying. Now, situated on either side of 1 Samuel 14 would be 1 Samuel 13 and 1 Samuel 15, if I've got my counting down correctly there. There are two episodes in Saul's life in those passages that serve as an illustrative backdrop to the vivid truth that we see in 1 Samuel 14 with Jonathan and his armor 
bearer. It's as this is it's as if God places uh 1 Samuel 14 and that story right in the middle of 13 and 15 to really brighten what happens in chapter 14 with Jonathan. What are those things that happen in 1 Samuel 13? Well, in 1 Samuel 13, Saul didn't trust God, and he assumed and he usurped the position of the priest and he made a sacrifice. So we're familiar with that uh, passage. And then in 1 Samuel 15, Saul didn't fully obey God, and he spared Agag and the best of, uh, of all of the cattle and all the sheep. And so we have chapter 13 and chapter 15, instances where Saul did not uh, trust God with his timing specifically, nor did he obey God in, in not doing uh, what God told him to do. And then we have chapter 14, Jonathan and his armor bearer. Jonathan, in 1 Samuel 14, he displayed an unyielding trust and determined obedience to God. Now, we're going to try to go through this fairly quickly. Please don't get bogged down in the details of the names of people, uh, the names of different lo locations. Let's kind of read through those and get through those, but let's get the big picture of what we're trying to do here. What are the biblical characteristics of a person who is effectively trusting and obeying God? Trusting God and obeying God. Four of them that we're going to see in this passage. Now, these are four big picture truths. And the first one is simply this. Boldness is a characteristic of trusting and obeying God. Verses 1 through 3. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. Now, it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. Verse 3. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men, and Ahiah, the son of Ahiatub, Ichabod's brother, how'd you like that name, Ichabod, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest, in Shiloh, wearing an ephod, and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. All right, so let's pause, verses 1 through 3, and here's Jonathan, and he says to his armor bearer, let's go take this, Okay. And it's as if the Lord pauses that one uh, verse <clears throat> and gives us a description of Saul. We'll go into that description of Saul in just a minute. But I want us to first notice the conquest. Verse 1, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. Now this is no light task that Jonathan is wanting to do. He wants to honor the Lord. He wants to kick the enemy out. And he does so in bold fashion. And this action went against the common logic of warfare because there's only two that are doing this. But Jonathan seems undeterred. So it's bold in that it was just he and his armor bearer and God. But not only is it bold because of that, but it's bold because of his estimation of his own dad. Now, if you... I guess if you, let's see here, I guess. You're like, you're the preacher, you ought to know. Look at um, verse 29. Verse 29 of chapter 14. Here is Jonathan's estimation of his own father in verse 29. Then said Jonathan, my father hath troubled the land. That was Jonathan's estimation of his father. My father hath troubled the land. And here's Jonathan, and he is in a bold fashion telling his armor bearer, let's go take this city. It's over the hill, over, over in that direction. Let's go over there and let's take this city. Now that is the conquest. But I want us to notice the contrast. And here's where we get into a description of Saul. Okay, Here's the contrast, verse 2 and verse 3. Look at verse 2 again. And Saul tarried on the uttermost part of Gibeah under the pomegranate tree that, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. All right, we'll pause right there. And it's as if the Lord wants us to see the difference between Jonathan and Saul. So he interjects these couple of verses of Saul. Notice uh, four things here. First of all, Saul, in my estimation, was being portrayed as a coward in the midst of battle. 
Where do you see that? Well, of course, I'm looking at the passage where it says, And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah. Gibeah was a little over an hour east of the main battle, and Saul stayed safely away, where I think he probably should have been on the front line trying to lead his, his group of soldiers. So it was as if he was a coward in the midst of battle. But number two, he was comfortable in the midst of battle because it says that he was sitting under a pomegranate tree. Now, I may be digging a little bit here, but he, the vision I get is that he's relaxing, he's away from the action, he's not engaged, he's comfortable, he's taking care of himself, not very bold. Not only that, but he was, he was confident in the arm of, of men. It says he had 600. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a large army or having men there to help you. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but in this passage, in this context, we can kind of see the uh, distinction between Jonathan and Saul. Jonathan and one other, and then Saul relaxing away from the battle with 600 men under a pomegranate tree, just kind of chilling. All right, It's, it's a, kind of a weird contrast that's being given here. But then also, number four, Saul was presuming upon the power of God, which is the deadliest of all. You say, well, where do you see that? Well. In verse 3, there is a high priest named Ahiah who is wearing uh, an ephod. He is the high priest there. And that's kind of explained as far as Saul presuming upon the power of God in chapter 13. So if you flip over in your Bible there to chapter 13 and go to verse 13, the Bible says, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And so here it is. Saul was just told, you are not the man. I am pulling the kingdom away from you. But here he is, described in verse 3, in verse 2 and 3, as having this high priest there, and essentially it feels as if he is presuming upon God's power. If I have uh, a representative of God, I must have God himself. It doesn't matter my character, it doesn't matter where I am in life. If I go to church, okay, I read that a little bit into the passage, so maybe if I, if I have this particular um, relic of God that, that he's going to be pleased with me. If I carry my Bible with me, if I have the high priest with me, if I play golf with the pastor, then, then God must really like me because I'm being nice and I'm being kind of outwardly when it comes to my religion. That's kind of what I'm picking up here. And that would be the, the contrast between Jonathan and, and Saul. But here in this passage in, in chapter 14, Jonathan is showing boldness. Okay, so point one is here and it's done. Boldness is a characteristic of those who trust and obey God, number two. Number two, perseverance is a characteristic. Perseverance, and we'll see that in the passage here. Perseverance is a characteristic of trusting and obeying God. Now look at verse four of chapter 14. Verse four and verse five. And between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over into the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sina. The forefront of the one was situate northward over against Michmash, and the other southward over against Gibeah. Now, don't worry about the names of the rocks. Don't worry about where it was situated. As the Bible says, don't worry about necessarily that. Just know that what Scripture is saying here is that this was a difficult thing they're about to do. A very sharp rock here, a very sharp rock there. Now look at verse 13. Verse 13, And Jonathan climbed upon, up upon his hands and upon his feet, <clears throat> and his armor-bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor-bearer slew after him. So we're going to look at the first part of verse 13, how the Bible describes Jonathan and his armor bearer climbing on their hands and their feet. Now let me ask you this, have you, have any of you ever been climbing uh, with family members or with a youth group or with, you know, college students or whoever, just by yourself, and you were climbing such a steep terrain that you were actually on your hands and on your feet trying to get up? Anybody? A lot of you. A lot of you. So use that experience in your life and get the idea of what's happening here in this passage. 
This is something that is not easily done. And if this is going to happen, you have got to persevere. I know I've used this illustration before, but I keep going back to a time in my life that occurred when I was in high school. I was in a youth group here at Morningside, and it, and, and it occurred uh, in, on a missions trip and where I did not, and my wife, she wasn't my wife at the time, but uh, Bethany was with me, and I did not persevere. We were climbing Mount St. Helens. And we were going up Mount St. Helens. It did not come to the point of hands and knees, but it was really cold. It started sleeting, and this is during a summer missions trip, right? And our guide was with us, and I wanted to prevail. I'm trying to make myself the hero of this illustration. It's not going to work, though, because I, I flopped. And I'm going up the mountain, and, and Bethany is, is there, and several other teens are there, and our guide is there, and, and who but a handful of teenagers um, went right on by and just kept going, one of which was, still is, the daughter of our beloved uh, former pastor, Tony Miller. Uh, her name would be Margina. And so she's just trucking right past us, and she's going all the way up, and the guide tells me and the others... It is getting too difficult. It was really, really foggy. We could not see the markers and as Margina is trucking up the mountain. And he says, I can't go any further. We need to turn back. We did not persevere. Your daughter did. Congratulations. She got to the, all the way to the top of Mount St. Helens. Just to say that you can go to the top of Mount is a neat thing. I've never been able to do that. All I could say is, I've hiked Mount St. Helens. And people would say, really, what was it like? I don't know, never made it to the top. That is not what I like to, to say uh, about me and my experience with Mount St. Helens. But Margina said that once you broke through the clouds, it was gorgeous. Blue sky, uh, warm. It was really, really nice up there. All I can do is live through her experience and her description. Perseverance. These guys, when they got to the top of this hill, were not going to experience a blue sky Mount St. Helens moment. They persevered, persevered through difficulty of just getting up the mountain, let alone what waited for them at the top. Perseverance in the midst of obstacles, that's what we're saying here. Because when you are going to decide to trust and obey God, you can guarantee obstacles will be put in your way. It will happen. The text points our attention to the difficulty of the terrain. But it, but it doesn't deter Jonathan. It doesn't deter he and his armor bearer from trusting and obeying the Lord. Perseverance in the midst of, of pain. Now, as the Bible describes that there are sharp rocks, and here he is on his hands and his, and, his, and his feet, that's painful. That's painful going up. And I'm going to pull out of this passage that they had perseverance in the midst of pain. Not only the difficulty of the terrain, but the difficulty of the task. Obedience and trust can be painful at times. But you and I should persevere. Perseverance is a characteristic of trusting and obeying. It carries the idea, perseverance carries the idea of continuing in a task. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14, Paul says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. <clears throat> One day George Mueller began praying for five of his friends, talking about perseverance. After many months, one of them trusted Christ. Ten years later, two more of those friends trusted Christ. It took 25 years before the fourth man was saved. And those of you who are familiar with him and his ministry, it was finally after his death, after praying for 52 years, that his fifth friend finally trusted Christ. That would be an example of perseverance. Would be that guy right there. 
But not only is boldness and perseverance a biblical characteristics, but also, number three, confidence. You and I have to have confidence. But not confidence in yourself. We'll get to that in just a little bit. But in this passage, we see confidence taking shape here. A couple of things about confidence. Jonathan was showing confidence in the way he was planning things. Now, I want you to look at your Bible in verse 6 of chapter 14. Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, let us go up, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Look at verse 8 and verse 11, verse, verse 8 through 11. <coughs> Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. Not that they discover themselves necessarily, but that they say, Here we are, you know, one of those kind of moments. Verse 9, If they say thus to us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, Come up unto us, then we will go up, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. Verse 11, And both of them discovered themselves into the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. He showed confidence in the way that he planned. So here he is, and he said, Let's go up over this hill. Let's take the garrison of the Philistines. But before we do... Let's plan this out. We're going to go up here, and we're going to say, here we are. If they say, we're coming to you, we'll stay put. If they say, coming up here, we'll go up there, and God is going to give them into our hands. There is a sense of planning. So it's not just blind confidence or blind action. It is a well-thought-out confidence. And so not only showing confidence in the way he planned, but showing confidence in others. Look at verse 7. And his armor-bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart, turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. We see the faithful, inspired remarks of Jonathan's friend. This friend sees the bold, persevering, confident trust that he has in the Lord, and it strengthened him as well. In other words, this action that Jonathan is taking is influencing his armor-bearer. And we can kind of park on that for a little bit of time here. The influence that your boldness, your perseverance, and your confidence has on others. The, inf the, the influence that you have on your children. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. You have influence if you're exercising these characteristics of trusting and obedience. Not only is boldness and perseverance and confidence biblical characteristics, but also, the final one here, victory. Victory is a characteristic of trusting and obedience. Verse 12 through 15. So let's read verse 12 through 15 in 1 Samuel chapter 14. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. I always found that peculiar, the way that is just worded. Come up to us and we'll show you something up here. Okay? Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into our hand, in, in, I'm sorry, into the hand of Israel. Verse 13, And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands, upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, a half acre of land, which a yoke of oxen might plow, verse 15. And there was trembling in the host, in the field, and among all the people, and the garrison, and the spoilers. They also trembled, and the earthquake, so it was a very great trembling. All right. If you are trusting and obeying your God, Victory is going to be a characteristic of that. Trusting and obeying. Victory is sure. Jonathan even says in verse 12, For the Lord hath delivered them into our hand. The battle hadn't even started yet. That actually goes back to our, to our point of confidence. 
The battle hadn't even started yet. And Jonathan said, all right, let's go. God's given them into our hand. Here it is. Victory is sure. And then not only that, but victory is a struggle because they still had to get up there. And like I said earlier, what waited for them at the top of this mountain was not pretty. But they got to the top and God delivered these men into the, into the hands of those two men. And so we see here that victory is a characteristic of trusting and obeying. Victory can also be stirring. Don't you love it when you hear stories of people who are victorious in their Christian life? Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's uh, something else uh, uh, that's going on in their life. Uh, uh, I don't know, some sort of relationship that's happening that's negative. And you hear stories of them getting victory in that arena. And they quit that sinning habit or they restore that relationship. Victory is a stirring thing. Look at verse 13. Jonathan climbed up on his hands and upon his feet uh, and his armor bearer after him. His armor bearer didn't stay put. It was inspiring to see Jonathan go. And if I could pause for just a little bit of application here, back to where actually where I live a little bit here. Mom and dad, do you realize how inspiring you are when you trust and obey God? How inspiring you are when your children see that you are trusting and obeying God. And it stirs your children to trust and obey God. Victory is also supernatural. Because the Bible says in verse 15 that there was a trembling. And this trembling just kind of spread out. Which is interesting. One commentator says that there arose a terror in the camp upon the field... In other words, the principal camp, as well as among all the people, in other words, of the advanced outpost of the Philistines, and then the garrison, which this commentator says is the army that was encamped at Michmash, and then the spoilers, they also trembled, and the earth quaked, a supernatural terror miraculously infused by God in the Philistines. And you and I both know that victory ultimately is supernatural. It's really, it's really not us. Our part is trusting and obeying. Now I have to admit, there is a fifth point here that I've actually been really anxious to get to. Because lest we end the message with a weak admonition of be like Jonathan... I think it's vital that I make one last point. And here it is, point five. Don't be like Jonathan. <laughs> say, wait, wait, what? Here's what I mean by that. Don't just be like Jonathan, but rather look to Christ. Because we can be bold, we can persevere, we can be confident. But if we do all of those things without acknowledging our Savior Christ. What's the point? Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, the Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And here's the vital passage here. For it is God which works in you both to, to, to will and to do of His good pleasure. Can I say that again? It is God which works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. God works in us to create boldness. Do you realize that? Jesus Christ works in us to create perseverance, to create confidence, to create victory. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone who does that. Our job is to trust and obey Jesus comes in and He gives us that boldness. And by His Spirit allows us to persevere under difficulty. And by His Spirit allows us to be confident in what He's called us to do and ultimately be victorious. Christ was bold. John chapter 2 and verse 15. Very familiar passage. And when He, Jesus, had made a scourge of small cords, He drove them all out of the temple 
and the sheep and the oxen and poured out all the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Christ was bold in the calling that God gave him. That was him. That was him. This is us. Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. Very familiar passage. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had what? They had been with Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, let's not forget that in all of our boldness and in all of our perseverance and in all of our confidence and in all of our victories that we perceive as being our part because we're just hanging in there, it's truly due because of Jesus Christ. Because of how He lives in our heart. What has God called you to do? Well, I mean, ultimately, in the big picture, 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So the big picture, there it is. But in the small picture, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what God's will is. What has God called you to do? Be bold in it. Be bold in transforming your mind through Scripture. Be bold in your prayer life. Be bold in the calling that God has given to you. Christ was bold, and we can be bold too through Him. Christ was persevering. Here's the picture of Christ heading to the cross, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go towards Jerusalem. The word steadfastly carries this idea, fixedness on purpose in the face of difficulty and danger. Christ was fixed on the goal, on the purpose, in the midst of difficulty and danger. You and I have our fair share of difficulty and danger. Certainly difficulty. And we must face it steadfastly. We must face it perseveringly as our Lord did. He did it. And He wants us to do it too. Look to Christ. Another picture of Him being persevering in the face of of difficulty going to the cross, Isaiah 50, verse 6 through 8, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Christ had that attitude. He had that mind. What does Scripture say? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So please do not be like a Jonathan only, but rather follow Christ. Because he's the one that allows us and gives us the strength to persevere. That was him. That was his illustration of perseverance. Here's us. 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 17 and 18. Peter speaking to the suffering church. He says this, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things, beware lest you also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Peter was admonishing the believers there in the midst of difficulty to grow in the relationship they have with the grace of Christ. Peter didn't go back to 1 Samuel and say, be like Jonathan. I like Jonathan. Good man. But if we leave the message at Jonathan, we failed to acknowledge and uplift and exalt Jesus Christ and where he belongs in our heart. Persevere under difficult circumstances. Christ was confident. I love this passage in Matthew chapter 9. Here's an illustration of Christ being confident. 
<clears throat> and he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick with a palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick with a palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. I love that passage because that is not what people were expecting. I love that. I love reading that. And I think the Lord knew exactly what he was doing. I say think. I better scratch that. He knew exactly what he was doing. Here he is, the man of the palsy is being brought to him, and he says, your sins are forgiven. Do you not think that he knew how he was going to blow the minds of the people there looking to criticize him? What a great passage. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Could you imagine if you had a thought of evil in your heart and the Lord looked at you and said, why are you thinking that? Wow. For whether it is easier to say, verse 5, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up, take your bed, and walk but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then he says to the sick of the palsy, Rise up, take your bed and walk. Wow! What confidence Christ had in the midst of very serious difficulty there. The confidence to say, I have the authority to not only heal this person, to, to, but to forgive him as well. Of course, you and I don't have any authority to forgive the sin that casts people into hell or to heal. But God still says that he wants us to be confident. First John 2.28, 2, 2, And now, little children, abide in him. Keep that thought in your mind. Abide in him. That, when he shall appear, we may have confidence. And not be ashamed before him at his coming. You know that our Lord wants us to have the same kind of confidence that he had in Mark chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9. And in Mark. Whatever that says. In Matthew chapter 9. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. God wants you and I to be confident, but not confident like Jonathan was, but confident in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the one that works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Christ, lastly, was victorious. Here's the illustration of Christ, the slain lamb, becoming the powerful lion, Revelation 5, 5 and 6. One of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. In verse 6, And I behold, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. And in two verses we see that Jesus Christ was the, the lamb as it had been slain, but then the victorious lion of the tribe of Judah. We have the last book of eternity right here. In Revelation, we have the last chapter, we have the last verse. We know what's going to happen. Christ is victorious. He was victorious in the passages here that we see. He's always going to be victorious. And so we look to Christ to help us to be victorious. What are you struggling in? What relationship is broken? What habit of life is just dominating you? Look to Jesus Christ for that victory. Don't just bolster yourself and say, I need to be more bold, I need to be more this, I need to be more that, I need to be more like Jonathan, but look to Jesus Christ. Have you been neglecting your prayer life? You're not looking to Christ. Have you been neglecting your Bible reading? You're not looking to Christ. Scripture gives it to us very plainly. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through, through our Lord Jesus Christ. In conclusion, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him. 
Have you ever looked at to what that word meant, consider? Meditate, dwell upon, focus your attention on Him. For consider Him, for consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest you be weary and faint in the way. So the message tonight, 1 Samuel chapter 14, God wants us to be bold. He wants us to persevere. He wants us to be confident. He wants to hand us uh, victory. But if you are turning your gaze away from considering Christ to considering the problem, you're going to fail in those areas. And so look to Christ, praise Christ, honor Christ, thank Christ. Focus your attention on Him, not on the world, not on the problem, not on the sin, but on Him. We can be bold in Christ. We can persevere in Christ. We can be confident in Christ. We can be victorious in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're truly grateful for the great illustration of 1 Samuel 14. We appreciate the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer and how they were bold, how they persevered in difficulty, how they were confident, and how you gave them victory and what an encouragement that story is and how you work in our lives and how you have protected and provided for your children. But Lord, we would fail much if we walked away and not looked to our Savior Jesus Christ, who himself was bold and persevered and who himself was confident in, in his Father and was victorious over sin, over death. And so may we leave here this evening with the reminder and the exhortation to look to our Savior Jesus Christ, who not only saves us from our sin for all eternity, but saves us from day to day in the life that you have given us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Webb. It's neat to see how God ordains for certain themes on certain Lord's Day. And this morning we looked at growing in Christ by obeying, and tonight at how we are to trust and obey. And what a wonderful reminder for those of you who are right now uh, facing a trial, maybe an insurmountable circumstance. Here's Jonathan and his armor bearer, outnumbered 10 to 1. They have the low ground, the enemy has the high ground, and yet he obeys uh, the will of the Lord, he takes action, and I love that verse 6 where he says, come let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. So there's this element of obedience, but also of trust in the sovereignty of God for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And there may be some circumstance in your life right now and you think, I, I don't see how if I obey, I don't see how if I take the action the Lord is calling me to, that there's any way that I could have victory, that there's any way that I can be confident, that I'll persevere and be bold. And yet ultimately it's not in you. It's Christ. It's the Lord. And we can say, just as Jonathan did, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for there's no restraint on the Lord to work to save by many or by few. So I hope that that will be our, our uppermost on our thoughts as we leave the Lord's house this Lord's day, is that we can obey and we can trust as God's people because He is sovereign and because He loves us and we're called to obey Him. I, I want